Most people probably assume that a good map is an objective and accurate portrayal of the world, not Jerry Broughton. In his new book, A History of the World in 12 Maps, he argues that most maps tell you as much about the society that produced them and the beliefs of the mapmaker as they do about the world. We came here to the library at the Royal Geographical Society in London, where they have a rather fine collection of historic maps, to meet the author. Jerry Broughton, we're surrounded here by maps, old maps, and you're clearly fascinated by them. Why? What started it? I come from the north of England, and there's some way in which geography is somehow your destiny, that somehow being a northerner um, defined who you were. And also, I lived in East Berlin for quite a long time, and so was faced with living in a space where somehow geography or the mapping of somewhere that was east or west or north or south was somehow really important. And the key point you're trying to get across in this book is that there is no such thing as a neutral, objective map. Every map reveals the prejudices, the ideological background of the people who made it. Yeah, I mean, any map um, is basically making selective decisions about what it puts in and what it leaves out. You, know, you can only have a map on a one-to-one -one scale that's actually objective and real. Anything else is making selective decisions, as all these kind of maps do. And of course, when you're looking at the world, you can never square the circle. You can't put a globe onto a flat piece of paper. You have to make distortions, omissions, decisions about what you do. And all cultures do that. And that's really one of the things that the book's interested in, that all cultures create a worldview through maps. Now, one of the people who figures large in the book, in the centre of the book, is uh, Gerard Mercator, the man who's projection of the, whose attempt to solve this problem of, of portraying a, 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 a round earth on a flat plane uh, produced uh, a groundbreaking projection. Now this is one of his books, this has got a map here of Spain, when was this printed? This is from the late 16th century, so his famous projection is 1569. Um, he also makes the first book that's called an atlas, so this is his atlas. And what's so clever about that? Because his projection survived. I mean, there's one over there, a 19th century uh, map of the world on Mercator's projection. What was it that his approach had that previous approaches hadn't? What he allowed people to do was navigate using a straight line of bearing. So, of course, any navigator is navigating across um, the sea, but that sea is curved because the globe is curved. So what Mercator did was basically stretch the lines of latitude and longitude to enable you to draw a flat map that you could draw a straight line that got you from A to B. Let's sort of leap over the 19th century and have a look at what map makers were doing in the 20th century and right up to date in the 21st century. So here's a splendid example of a map of, 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 of propaganda, really. This is the Navy League map of the British Empire, published sometime in the 1920s, much of the world coloured red. And this was typical of the way map making was sort of co-opted by political interests in the 19th, 20th century, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is seriously political geography in tooth and claw. I mean, again, it's using the Mercator projection, and it's really a way of celebrating the empire. There's no other reason for this map. It doesn't help you navigate. It's not about getting from A to B. It is about political power and authority. And in the book, you've got one or two startling examples of maps as propaganda. There is, for instance, a Nazi map of Czechoslovakia. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's precisely to show that Czechoslovakia is somehow an enormous threat to Germany. So it's distorting the shape of Czechoslovakia, the way in which the artistic uh, dimension shows this actually quite small country bearing down on Germany. And it's simply a way of disseminating a visual image which is completely bears no reality. And map making became, in the 20th century, on occasion, tremendously controversial. There's a book here by a man called Arno Peters, the Peters Atlas of the World, and he thought he'd come up with a better way of showing the world this perennial problem of how you show a globe on a flat plane. Why was this projection so controversial? Well, this is interesting because it's about an equal area map. Arno Peters was a left-wing historian and geographer who believed that the Mercator projection was Eurocentric, that it basically showed particularly Europe um, over and above Southeast Asia and Africa, which were diminished in size. So he took a different kind of projection. That's all he did. Mercator used a particular kind of projection. Peters offers a different one, which is called an equal area projection, which as a result leaves you with these extraordinary images of particularly um, Africa 
and South America as these long, e elongated, like teardrops, very, very different to Mercator. So I think that what Peter's put his finger on is this issue of partiality. Any map of the world is partial. It has a certain story to tell because we can never have an objective, consistent, real image of the Earth. We just can't do it. We can't square that circle. All right, here's what looks like an objective image of the world. This is Google Earth, um, and it's a circular image, so it gets around the big problem of trying to portray uh, the, the world on a flat surface. Now, you have a lot of reservations, don't you, about Google Earth? Uh, yet, to many people, it's a wonderful application. It is great technology, and that's what I first thought when I started doing the work on it. But I don't, do now think that because of the way in which they have bought up so much of the data, which they fed into this um, geospatial application, is what they call it, um, they are monopolizing maps online. If you go online and you're using maps, you are probably using a Google map. And there's also some sort of sinister and worrying dimensions to Google because they buy Earth Viewer, which is the application, um, and that is funded by the CIA. This is the company that they buy that provides them with the ability to produce this. That's right, and first came to prominence because it was a great way of visualizing bombing raids in the first Gulf War. Um, and Google saw that and thought, we're interested in that. I mean, that's interesting that the CIA government had a hand in funding it, but it's sinister. You say, why is it sinister? Well, because we don't know how those applications were then subsequently used for military purposes. Um, and I think Google at first struggled to work out where it was going to go. They were first using this application to sell um, real estate. And now they've worked out that what they can do is use it as part of their search capability. Because you, we are searching now geographically. And that's why maps have become so important online today. Because you search for something, you're searching geographically. Not numerically or alphabetically, you're searching about where things are in the world. And that's why possession of this geospatial data is so incredibly important and profitable. This is about money. Jerry Broughton, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.